everybody for coming here tonight. Uh, welcome to the 2018 Federalist Society uh, North Carolina Judicial Candidates Forum. My name is Kevin Hales. I'm an attorney with Cisco Systems and RTP and uh, president of the Federalist Society. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, and first let me give a slight introduction to to use their fantastic space and setting up this fantastic uh, sunset over here for us today. Thank you, Parker Pope. Um, and uh, a special thanks to Andrew Brown of Shanahan McDougall and to Catherine Lawson of Parker Pope for doing the lion's share of work and putting this event together. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, let me tell you quickly about the Federalist Society uh, for Law and Public Policy Studies. Uh, we're a group of over 40,000 lawyers, law students, scholars, and other individuals located in every state and law school in the country. Um, it, we focus on the role that government plays in the lives of citizens and the role of the judiciary in maintaining freedom and liberty. Uh, the Triangle Lawyers chapter is one of numerous local chapters that seek to foster serious dialogue on uh, these and other legal issues. Tonight we are together to hear from the candidates running for, for seats on the North Carolina Supreme Court and Court of Appeals. These elections are so important. Rulings from these courts intimately and profoundly affect the lives and livelihoods of all North Carolinians. Uh, despite this, polls consistently show the judiciary is the branch of government that people know the least about. Um, we hope that forums like this will uh, you know, draw more attention to judicial races, increase public interest in the candidates, and help develop a more informed electorate. One last thing before I introduce tonight's moderator. The Federal Society is a nonpartisan organization. It does not advocate for the election of any particular candidate, and it does not take specific positions on any uh, particular legal or public policy question. Invitations to participate in this candidate forum were extended to all candidates running for the North Carolina Supreme Court and Court of Appeals. We greatly appreciate that so many of the candidates were able to attend. We truly thank you uh, for being here. So tonight, our candidate forum will be moderated by broadcaster and writer Donna Martinez. Uh, Donna is Vice President of Marketing and Communications for the John Locke Foundation and host and producer for Curtis Media Group, which includes News Radio w, uh, 680 WPTF. Uh, she co-hosts the Triangle's uh, Afternoon News with her husband, Rick Martinez. Uh, she also co-hosts with Je Mitch, Mitch Kokai the John Locke Foundation's weekly radio show, Carolina Journal Radio. She is a wonderful professional, and we're so happy to have her back. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Donna Martinez. Thank you very much to the Triangle Chapter of the Federalist Society for asking me once again to be part of this forum. I really am honored um, to be here this evening. Uh, like all of you, I think it's so important that we showcase some um, statewide judicial races. As Kevin mentioned, a lot of people uh, don't know very much about the judicial system and the judicial branch, and I'm hoping that out of this and the fact that we're videotaping on behalf of the Federalist Society, that more people will come to understand not only the role of the courts, but who you all are, and uh, all of you who are seeking uh, public office. This year, of course, North Carolinians will choose one member of the North Carolina Supreme Court and three members of the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I'm delighted to tell you that uh, nearly all of the statewide judicial candidates are, are joining us tonight. I believe we have everyone except one candidate uh, that did not respond to the invitation. So candidates, thank you so much. We appreciate you being here. And audience, thank you as well for what you do is, by signaling with your presence, is that this really is important, that these races are consequential, and that they are worthy of every voter's time and attention before they head to the ballot box. Candidates, the Federalist Society's format for this evening is designed so that each and every one of you, regardless of whether you are an incumbent or a challenger, can actually make a direct connection with the voters to let us know who you are and what you believe. We're dividing the forum into two segments this evening. Now first, we're going to hear from the women and the men who are seeking a seat on our second highest court, the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Each candidate will have up to three minutes to share whatever it is that each one of you wants all of us to know about you and why you're running. We'll hear from those folks in just a moment. 
Now, following the Court of Appeals candidates, we will invite the three candidates for the North Carolina Supreme Court to take a seat right up here. Uh, most questions will be actually addressed to a specific candidate, but in some cases I may ask um, anyone who wants to answer to jump in first, and we'll get to that once the Supreme Court candidates uh, come to the, the table. But uh, we encourage the, <coughs> all the candidates to join in on any question when it comes to the Supreme Court portion of this evening. We hope that uh, the three candidates will feel free to agree, to disagree, to amplify a point, to add a point, it's really up to them. Uh, we hope that um, we will have a, a good, robust conversation. So let's go ahead and get started now. First, I'd like you to meet the candidates for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. Three seats are on the ballot. Seven of the eight candidates are here with us, if I have my, my math right this evening. Uh, candidate Michael Monaco did not respond to the Federalist Society's invitation, so he is not joining us this evening. Candidates, again, you have up to three minutes. Now, when you have about 30 seconds left, Kevin is going to be the time keeper here. He's going to give you that signal so that uh, you know that it's time to wrap up your comments and then we'll move on to the next candidate. So first, for seat one on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, the candidates in the order that they appear on the ballot are Andrew Heath and John Arrowwood. Please welcome Superior Court Judge Andrew Heath to the podium. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Andrew Heath, and I'm running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals. I'm a current Superior Court judge. I have my office here in Wake County, but I'm a special Superior Court judge, which means that I travel the state wherever I'm needed, uh, presiding over Superior Court. I've held court now in 34 of our state's 100 counties, uh, everything from medical malpractice to murder trials, and pretty much everything in between. And I have a good base of knowledge <coughs> with respect to how our trial courts work. Um, before that, I was the, uh, I practiced law at Hedrick Gardner doing workers' compensation defense, and uh, was asked by the governor, Governor McCrory, to uh, move my family from Wilmington to Raleigh to serve as the chairman of the Industrial Commission. So uh, that is the state agency, obviously, that administers the Workers' Compensation Act. So uh, we had about 160 employees, including uh, 22 deputy commissioners that serve as trial court judges, and then six com commissioners that uh, sort of operate like the Court of Appeals does in determining appeals of workers' compensation decisions. Uh, we took sort of an aggressive posture towards reform at the Industrial Commission, meaning that we uh, tried to bend some of the workers' compensation rates down a little bit to, to ease the burden on employers and stimulate growth in our economy. But we did it in a way that did not infringe or disrupt the uh, benefit structure for injured workers. Um, we were able to achieve lost cost rate reductions that are now year over year in the double digits. So it's a big ease on the employer community in the state. We also uh, made efficiencies in the way that we operated the Industrial Commission and were able to achieve pretty significant budget reductions uh, and were the only state agency, I believe, that was able to do that. And so the governor took note of that and he promoted me to the state budget director. So I was in charge of preparing the governor's $22 billion proposed state budget and <coughs> negotiating the finer details with General Assembly leadership. Uh, that budget I'm very proud of. It featured middle class tax cuts, it featured uh, significant pay raises to teachers, and it featured a, a huge investment in the state's rainy day fund. So all the things that you would expect from a conservative administration, uh, we were able to do uh, in the McCrory term. So um, I was appointed to serve as a Superior Court judge, as I said. Uh, why vote for me? Um, I have that base of knowledge of a trial court judge. I wasn't just on there for a few months here and there. I have presided over murder trials, over medical malpractice trials, over high stakes trials. I'm also the only candidate that has any workers' compensation experience. And that is a huge component of what the, the Court of Appeals hears. So uh, you know my record. Uh, you can Google me. Uh, you can go to my website. Uh, I'm a somebody who aligns closely with the ideals of this organization, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judge Keith. 
Now, Judge Keith's opponent for the Court of Appeals is Court of Appeals Judge John Arrowwood. Please welcome to the podium Judge Arrowwood. Thank you and thank you to the Federalist Society for this invitation. To render justice fairly and without favoritism to either party or to the state, consistent with the Constitution of North Carolina, the laws thereof, not inconsistent with the Constitution of the laws of the United States. That was the oath I took, and that is the philosophy that I employ as a judge on the Court of Appeals. I suggest to you that there are about 200 cases out there that you can judge whether what kind of a job I am doing in doing that. I think that my experience that I bring to this job is critical to how I do my job. I worked at the court. I was a staff attorney and the senior staff lawyer there for about five years. I then moved to Charlotte where for approximately 26 years I was in private practice, 23 of those as a partner, doing civil, complex commercial, employment and administrative regulation work. While I was in private practice, I also served on the Banking Commission, the Rules Review Commission, as a director of the North Carolina Railroad. In my practice, I represented both plaintiffs and defendants, both individuals and corporations, in cases from small contract disputes to multi-jurisdictional class action defense. I submit to you that those experiences are what is needed at our Court of Appeals. I was a Supreme Court judge for a short period of time, and I've been on the court enough to do 200 opinions. And I submit to you that one way that you can tell that I am doing the job, I have been endorsed by both the Advocates for Justice, as you know, who represents the plaintiffs bar, and the North Carolina Defense Fund, which is the PAC for the defense lawyers. I'm proud to have both of those endorsements because I believe that tells you that I am doing a good job. I ask for your vote. I ask for your support. Again, it's John Arrowwood and it's in seat one. Thank you. For seat two on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, the candidates in the order they appear on the ballot are Jefferson Griffin, Tobias Toby Hampson, and Sandra Alice Ray. Please welcome to the podium Judge Jefferson Griffin. Thank you, uh, Donna. Thank you, Federal Society, for having us here tonight. Uh, I am Judge Jefferson Griffin, one of your district court judges here in Wake County. I started out in Nash County. I grew up on a farm there. Uh, and then I went up to Chapel Hill and then North Carolina Central Law School. And I uh, started practicing down in Kinston, in Lenore County. I was brought in to do civil defense work, ended up doing criminal defense and everything that a general practitioner does in uh, a small issue in North Carolina town. But it was great. Got to travel all over the East, um, made a lot of great lawyers, and got a lot of great experience very fast. Uh, in 2010, Colin Willoughby hired me. Uh, to come to the DA's office here in Wake County. Uh, as a lateral coming in with some experience, I got to move up very quickly. Uh, I was able to prosecute everything from fraction of the homicides here in Wake County. Got a great trial experience. Uh, ran for DA and lost. Learned great, great lessons there. Uh, then was appointed to the bench, uh, district court bench here. Uh, and in 16, I stood to defend that bench here in Wake County and uh, ran unopposed. So uh, that's how we got here. Um, the campaign trail has been great. Uh, we have met a ton of great people across the state. Um, I think a couple of things to point out about my experience and how um, how it makes me the most qualified candidate for this race. Um, you know, the judicial experience in itself is important. Um, you know, we're all trained to be advocates coming out of school, but not everybody's cut out to be a judge. And until you've been put in that situation where you have to remove yourself from that, and you've been tested as a judge, make sure that you can be fair and impartial on every matter. Uh, I think that's, that's a very, very uh, important role for judicial candidates to have. And I think I've proven that in my service on the district board bench here. Uh, and I was a civil defense attorney and a prosecutor. And I was a North Carolina Advocates for Justice. So those two usually don't go together. 
Um, so I think, and I was also a North Southern North Carolina Association of Defense Attorneys. Uh, I think, and when I was all those groups, you got 5,000 lawyers in Wake County. Uh, you got more than a handful that practice in front of me every day. Go talk to them. Ask how I'm in court, how I treat people, how I'm prepared, uh, and my demeanor. And uh, I think they did that, and they chose to endorse our campaign. Um, another thing about me, I served in the North Carolina Army National Guard, and I'm a captain of the Guard. So while I'm not an advocate over there, I still need to do a little bit of advocacy for my soldiers who are some of the, the most uh, vulnerable in our community sometimes. I'm very proud of that. I get to do operational law, rules of engagement, and I was a commander. Um, we've worked extremely hard. Um, websites, JeffersonGriven.com, if there's anything else, I'll be here afterwards also. And I uh, would appreciate your, your vote and support uh, coming up here early voting and uh, November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Griffin. And also seeking this seat is Tobias Toby Hampson. Attorney Hampson, please join us. Well, thank you. Good evening. I am Toby Hampson, running for seat number two on the North Carolina Court of Appeals. That, of course, is the seat uh, currently held by Judge Calabria, who is, who is not running again. I, I was not born in North Carolina, but North Carolina is my home. I grew up mainly down in Moore County, attending schools like Sandals Farm Life and Union Pines High. Uh, my mom was a teacher at Sandals Community College. Uh, I graduated from the North Carolina School of Science and Math in Durham. I went away to American uh, D.C. for college before coming back home to Bowie's Creek and attending law school at Campbell. I currently live here in Wake County uh, with my wife uh, and three children. My wife, Kristen, is an amazing lawyer uh, in her own right. In fact, I joke that the moment you realize you're not even the best lawyer in your family is the time to run for judge. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, so North Carolina is my home. I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be here and I'm proud to stand, stand before y'all. I, you know, I, I'm running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals because I believe that now more than ever, we do need judges on that court who have the right experience. Real, hands-on experience dealing with all the kinds of cases that court hears. You know, that court is such an important court in our judicial system, hearing cases from, from all 100 counties and in practically every area of law. So for the last 16 years, uh, first clerking in the court for judges, Eddie Green, uh, Wanda Bryan, and Bob Hunter, Mountain Bob, and then in private practice in 2004, I focused my practice on the State Court of Appeals and State Supreme Court, uh, handling all the kinds of cases that that court hears, including representing indigent parents whose criminal rights are at risk, up to representing individuals and businesses in bed the farm complex commercial litigation, and everything in between, from family law to, to workers' compensation cases, medical malpractice. I help represent the towns, uh, Way Forest and Zebulon, and some of their zoning and planning matters. I'm certified by the North Carolina State Bar as an appellate specialist. I serve on the Appellate Rules Committee. Uh, I serve on the Appellate Specialization Committee. I've been regularly recognized by my peers as a super lawyer in appellate practice and was named one of the top 100 lawyers in North Carolina by that publication this year, one of the top 25 in Raleigh. Uh, been named to legal elite uh, in appellate practice. Uh, this was the first year they did that, and I was named to that. So I think I have the right experience to serve on the court, real hands-on experience. But you don't have to take my word for it. I've been endorsed by the News Observer, I've been endorsed by the Charlotte Observer, and in both those instances, those publications relied on my appellate experience. So I'm so proud to be endorsed by folks like North Carolina Advocates for Justice and the Women Attorneys and community groups and newspapers all around the state. I'm Toby Hampson, I'm running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals because I do have the right experience. Thank you. Thank you, Toby Hansen. Now, the third candidate for this seat is Sandra Alice Ray. Now, uh, Judge Ray has been held up in Wilmington, but representing her this evening is her daughter, Meredith Pryor. Um, just bear with me because I'm not the best at public speaking. But um, I'm Meredith Kreiner, I'm Judge Ray's daughter. I think I'm a really great person to speak on her behalf because I know she's a very honest person as my mom and as my role model, but also because I want to be in the judiciary. I'm actually an intern at the North Carolina Supreme Court right now and applying for law school, so hopefully I'll get it. But um, I think the number one takeaway about my mom is she has 27 years of legal experience, including 14 years of judicial experience. So she really has a lot of experience, more than all the other people running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals combined. 
Um, with that, she's been endorsed by the North Carolina Highway Patrol or North Carolina Troopers Association, as well as the North Carolina Fraternal Order of Police. Um, I just know from personal experience what a fair and honest person she is, how intelligent she is. She's been helping me with all of my applications, and just along with that, what a great attorney she is and judge. Now, um, she worked in the or in the DA's office. She owned her own private practice, and now is a judge. Uh, she really is the best person for this position. I'm really happy that I had. Um, the ability to come speak on her behalf tonight. Thank you, Mayor. This is Meredith Kreiner uh, speaking on behalf of her mother, Judge Sandra Alice Ray. So, your candidates for C2 on North Carolina Court of Appeals Jefferson Griffin, Tobias Toby Hampson, and Sandra Alice Ray. For C3 on the North Carolina Court of Appeals, the candidates in the order they appear on the ballot are Chuck Kitchen, Michael Monaco Sr., and Allegra Catherine Collins. Please welcome Attorney Chuck Kitchen to the podium. Thank you and good evening. I am Chuck Kitchen. I'm running for C3 as stated. I have been practicing law in North Carolina and am a native North Carolina for the past 38 years. For 30 of those years, I was county attorney in Alamance and Durham County. As many of you know, county attorneys uh, handle all types of civil litigation. We also advise the Sheriff's Department and represent the Sheriff's Department. Uh, fortunately for me, we did not have insurance in either of those counties, which means I got to litigate all those cases and then take them up on appeal. The I never had really planned on using that to run for <coughs> public office later on, especially for the appellate court, but it really prepares you for doing that. Not only do you have I handled <coughs> literally thousands of cases of different types, DSS, contracts, all kinds of major litigation, I also got to take them up on appeal without having to worry about insurance counsel saying, oh no, we're doing that, we're settling this case. Beyond that, I've had some great cases <coughs> that are very unusual, I would say. Uh, in the last it's nine years I've been in private practice. I've been representing both businesses and local governments. One of the fun cases I've had recently, uh, and I call it fun because it involves gambling. And everybody knows that gambling's fun unless you're the one doing it, which means you're just losing your money. I represent the sheriff down in Oslo County. Uh, they got the gambling industry got an injunction on enforcing the gambling laws. We took it up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court was kind enough to uh, dissolve the injunction and say, you know, the slot machines, there really are gambling. Went back down, at which time they decided to uh, dismiss my client, so I, was no, I would no longer be involved. So I, I've had to stop that uh, endeavor with Onslow County and taking up with the city of Monroe or dealing with it under our zoning laws, which is a lot more fun in a way. Beyond that, I am the only person I know of in the United States at this point who has defended against the 42 U.S.C. section 1414-1 case and actually tried it out. This was a case over in Alamance County where I wrote to the sheriff, the United States of America can bring a civil rights case without having a plaintiff. Now that is just a strange thing to do. I can tell you if you've ever tried doing it, you normally know you will depose the plaintiff. You'll say, what is, what are, what are you complaining about? Not a 1414-1 case. There is no plaintiff. There's nobody to depose. The only thing you can ask for is who are those people who are going to testify. That was something very unusual, great, a great experience for five years of my life, and we did prevail and beat the United States in that. I think you better wind up on your time. Yes, I am. I think. Um, what I wanted to tell you was I have the most experience of anyone running in my race. I have both trial experience and appellate experience. I think you need both in order to sit on the Court of Appeals. And I ask for your support this November. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kitchen. The 
second candidate for this seat is Michael <coughs> Monaco Sr. Mr. Monaco did not respond to the Federal Society's invitation to be part of this forum. The state's official judicial voter guide contains information about Mr. Monaco. And of course, you can find that voter guide at the website of the North Carolina Board of Elections. The third candidate for C3 on the North Carolina Court of Appeals is Allegra Catherine Collins. Professor Collins, uh, please join us here at the podium. Good evening. I am Allegra Collins, and I am running for seat number three, Judge Elmore's seat on the Court of Appeals. Thank you so much, Andrew, wherever you are, for organizing this. This has been fantastic. I'm a professor at Campbell Law School, and I teach judicial writing. I teach students how to draft opinions for judges on our Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. I teach them how to clerk. We take cases out of the courts and bring them in the classroom. We study them. We go and watch oral argument. The judges will come in sometimes and talk about the cases. The advocates will come in. It's been a fantastic way to get the court system involved in Campbell and vice versa. I also teach appellate advocacy, so I teach students how to advocate in our Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. I have my own appellate practice. And I practiced before our Court of Appeals and Supreme Court. Lots of you look very familiar, uh, as I see you here. Uh, and I have represented clients of both sides of the debate in all different kinds of cases. I am the vice chairperson of the appellate practice section of North Carolina Bar Association's appellate practice section. I'm also on their appellate rules committee. We study the rules of appellate practice and make recommendations to the Supreme Court for changes that might be made to those rules. Appellate law really is my job, it's my hobby, and it's absolutely my passion. And it's why I chose to run for the Court of Appeals. I started clerking under Judge Linda Stevens on the Court of Appeals when I came out of law school, and I was with her for almost four years. And when I started with her, people would ask me, would you like to be a judge? And I'd say, yeah, all she does is sit in her room and read and write. So I'm not so sure. But the more I worked with her and the more people would ask, by about six months in, I'd say, Judge Stevens sits in her room all day and reads and writes. Would absolutely love to do that. And so I continued on over to the Supreme Court and their appellate reporter's office. All the cases that come out of both appellate courts in our state go through the reporter's office. And I have a wonderful job of reading every case and heading those cases and indexing them and publishing them. I grew up playing soccer and I grew up playing sports. And some of the hard work and the dedication and the teamwork skills that I learned in those sports, I think is translated also into my appellate practice. I played professional tennis and I played at UCLA. And I had the honor of representing the United States twice in the Pan American Games in team handball. And if you don't know what team handball is, you should Google it. It's the second most popular team sport in the world behind soccer. It's kind of water polo on a basketball court. That being said, I understand teamwork, I understand hard work, and I really understand appellate law and process and procedure in our Court of Appeals. We talk about the trial courts, but what we look at so often in our courts is preservation of error, is standard of review, is precedent. We've got lots going on right now with NRA civil penalty, NRA LM, NRA LV. I understand that, that those layers are really important. So I appreciate your time, I ask you a vote, and I thank you. Professor Collins, thank you very much. So your candidates for seat three on the North Carolina Court of Appeals are Chuck Kitchen, Michael Monaco Sr., and Allegra Catherine Collins. And before we move to the candidates for the Supreme Court, I would just like to ask all the candidates for the Court of Appeals please to stand and be acknowledged by the folks here this evening. I want to thank you all for <laughs> move to the uh, North Carolina Supreme Court. This year, North Carolinians will choose from among three candidates for one seat on the state's highest court. Uh, our candidates are here, Andrew and Kevin. I'm just going to make sure that we have all of our three candidates who are here. Okay, we're good to go. All right, so what I'd like to do is to just briefly introduce each candidate. And candidates, as I, as I read you a very brief version of your biography, um, if you could please come up and take your seat, that would be very helpful. Again, uh, this is as they appear on the ballot. 
Justice Barbara Jackson. In November 2010, Barbara Jackson was elected to serve on the Supreme Court of North Carolina 20 years after beginning her career there as a law clerk for then Associate Justice Burley Mitchell, Jr. Previously, she served as Associate Judge on the North Carolina Court of Appeals for six years. Prior to taking office, she practiced law for 14 years, including serving as General Counsel to Commissioner uh, Commissioner Barry in the North Carolina Department of Labor. She also worked in Governor Jim Martin's office for an advocacy agency for persons with disabilities and also in private practice, concentrating in the area of land use and local government law prior to returning to public service, service at the Labor Department. Justice Barbara Jackson, thank you for joining us. Our second candidate for the seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court is Christopher James Anglin. He was born in a suburb of Houston, Texas. He went to college at Wake Forest University and law school at Elon University School of Law. He's currently um, employed with the Anglin Law Firm, which uh, he has owned since graduating from law school, and he practices uh, civil litigation. Mr. Anglin, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Also, our third candidate for the North Carolina Supreme Court, Anita Earls. Anita Earls is a civil rights attorney with 30 years experience litigating voting rights and other civil rights cases in partnership with community-based organizations. She was the founder and executive director of the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, a nonprofit legal advocacy organization, where she also litigated voting rights and other civil rights cases. She left that position in January 2018 to run for a seat on the North Carolina Supreme Court. She previously has served on the North Carolina State Board of Elections and the North Carolina Equal Access to Justice Commission. Ms. Earls, thank you very much for joining us. First, I'd like to just remind everyone to please turn your microphone on so that the ring is green there. There you go, Mr. Anglin, if you could turn that microphone on. Thank you. And also to everyone in the room know that there's a lot of microphones here, so anything that you may be saying is going to uh, potentially be picked up, so we would appreciate it if we could have all our attention on the candidates here. All right. Um, each of you is going to be uh, given an opportunity to make essentially an opening statement, as you know. Uh, I sort of liken it to sort of a one-minute commercial for each of you here just to kind of let people know what you would like them to know. We hope you'll use the one minute or so to tell us anything that uh, you think is important about you. We do ask that you keep it to about a minute so that we can go through the questions. And uh, once again, Kevin is right here. So if for some reason you decide to go way long over one minute, he's going to give you the sign to, to wrap that up. Please don't take that personally. It's just an effort to move things along. All right, let's begin then with Justice Jackson. Your opening statement, please. Thank you, Donna. Um, thanks to the Federal Society for hosting us this evening and to Parker Code for welcoming us, welcoming us into their offices. Um, I'm Barbara Jackson. I serve as a justice on your Supreme Court. I've now served as a judge for almost 14 years, six years on the Court of Appeals, and now almost seven on the Supreme Court. I'm the only candidate, almost eight on the Supreme Court, I'm the only candidate in this race who has any judicial experience. As you heard, I began my career at the Supreme Court as a law clerk for Rowan Mitchell. In my role, I've authored almost 700 opinions, uh, most of the Court of Appeals, a number of the Supreme Court, and I've sat on thousands of other cases. Uh, this is our state's court of last resort. I would submit to you that it's not an entry level position. Experience really does matter. So I'm asking for your support this fall as, we move, as we're in the selection season, and I'll welcome the opportunity to be with you further. Thank you. Thank you, Justice Jackson. Mr. Anglin? I also want to thank the Federal Society for having us here today. I think these forms are an important part of our race in order so that you can have a, you can more viewpoints and ask questions if you so choose. And as you may have heard, my name is Chris Anglin, and I'm running for the State Supreme Court. Um, and I'm running to show that partisan elections lead to, lead to candidates and results which are not reflective of the Constitution, and also to show that the General Assembly has overreached its powers, which are given to it in the separation of powers clause. And they will stop at nothing in order to make the 
judicial system and extension of the legislature. Uh, and just a brief information about me, I practice at all levels of the state and federal trial courts, everything from in both, in both criminal and civil cases, everything from um, real estate and estate planning to civil litigation involving construction, personal injury, or federal employment law. So I think the recent experience that I've had in in these areas give me the practical experience and give me the knowledge of the issues which are currently fa facing North Carolinians. Thank you, Mr. Anglin. Ms. Earls? Good evening. I'm Anita Earls, and I am also grateful to the Federalist Society for hosting this event and grateful to all of you for taking the time to be here and to hear from us directly. I have been a civil rights attorney for the past 30 years. I became an attorney because I grew up in a mixed race family and I saw the challenges that my parents faced and that my family faced, my father's black, my mother's white. And that gave me an appreciation of how important it is that we work towards equal justice under the law. So I wanted to be a lawyer from a very young age and I was really fortunate to be the first one in my family to go to college and to go to law school and to come to North Carolina uh, and work with Julius Chambers firm in Charlotte. So for the first 10 years of my career, I was in private practice, and I did a lot of civil rights cases, but we also had a, a general statewide practice. I handled family law cases, uh, criminal defense, uh, consumer, uh, automobile accident, personal injury cases. I tried jury trials in state and federal court, as well as um, argued appeals. So I had a very broad range of practice the first 10 years. And then was fortunate to be able to represent the United States as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Department of Justice in the Civil Rights Division. So for two and a half years, I participated in civil rights enforcement across the country. But I really wanted to be closer to the communities that I was working with, so I came back to North Carolina and worked again with Julius Chambers, this time at the UNC Center for Civil Rights. And approximately 11 years ago, um, I founded the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, because I wanted to give uh, students who came out of the law school a place where they could actually practice civil rights law in the South and, and to work regionally across the South. I've also, in my career, had the opportunity to be, in addition to the role of advocate, to be in a fact-finding uh, quasi-judicial role as a member of the State Board of Elections. So I served for two and a half years on that board, and uh, when cases came before us, we didn't ask whether the parties were Republican or Democrat. We applied campaign finance and election laws equally to everyone who came before the board. Ms. Earls, I think we're going to leave the questions or the statements there and move on to questions. Um, we're going a little bit over time. That's okay. okay. I apologize. We, we appreciate everyone being talkative. We want talkative here. So let's move on to the questions portion. And um, to that point, here's how I'd like this to work. Uh, when we go through the questions, I'll address each question to one particular candidate, but please feel free to join the conversation because for all of us to be more informed, it's most helpful if we can hear you all talk amongst yourselves to find out what you agree on or what you maybe don't agree on. So uh, don't be shy about that. Uh, so again, I'll, I'll address the question to one particular person. Each of you will be receiving some questions and then uh, the others can join in. All right, here we go. Let's start again. We're going to do this in the order that things appear on the ballot. First question to Justice Jackson. What court opinion that you've written, or an opinion that you admire, is a good representation of your judicial philosophy or your approach to jurisprudence? Um, gosh, I'll tell you my, my favorite opinion. Uh, my favorite opinion that I've written, and it was one that I wrote at the Court of Appeals, uh, was in Ray JDB. And it's a, a case about a young man in Greensboro who was uh, in the care of social services. And his, uh, he had a foster father who had passed away, and he was the recipient of his disability benefits. And he also had inherited a habitat uh, from him. And he unfortunately lost every living family member um, that he had, and then was placed with some alternative family members. And those didn't work out. So DSS took custody of him. And after taking custody of him, they started making payments to themselves rather than keeping up the payments on this home. And it went to uh, the Guardian of the Lightning Program took this into court and said that they weren't looking after his best interests, which is the obligation <coughs> under law for a juvenile. So 
they, it got brought up to us in the Court of Appeals. And you know, you never know how something's going to turn out. Certainly that was one case where uh, the heart would lead in one direction, but you're not sure where the law is going to lead you. And my direction to my law clerks always has been, you've got to follow the law no matter where it leads us. And this, in this instance, the law led us to the conclusion that, in fact, the DSS had the obligation to adhere to the best interest of this child. So the Tabitac house of things had to be made. Um, the young man was going to be aging out of foster care in less than three years, and this house would be available to him when he transitioned through foster care, which is really, if, if you know anything about the foster care system, quite a remarkable opportunity for someone. Um, so there is a ruling to say we're um, adhered to the law, and that was a very nice result. Would either of the other two candidates like to weigh, on, weigh in on issues of opinions that you've written or admire, or what Justice Jackson has described here? Well, I would like to just briefly give an example of a justice whose rulings I admire. So uh, Justice Henry Fry um, talks about how when he was in, uh, in the legislature, he, uh, he opposed the death penalty. But once he became on the court, he understood that he had to apply the law as, as, as it's written and, and the statutes as they're written. And that meant that in certain cases, he had to approve the, um, or, or affirm a judgment of a sentence of death against someone, and, and he did that. So, and I think that that is an example of a justice following the law even though his personal opinions may have led him somewhere else. And um, a judge who's, and this is an all calendar judge, a judge whose judicial philosophy I would follow and who I have a great amount of respect for is former Supreme Court Justice Bob Ort. He was a Republican and he served on the state Supreme Court in the 90s and early 2000s. And even though he was a Republican, I think his rulings um, were always fair and even-handed, and he did not show any sort of, um, and he didn't show any sort of partisan favoritism towards the Republican Party. I would be justice like that. Mr. Anglin, what value do you place on unanimity in a decision? Granted, uh, all cases are different, as we know, they require different treatments, but in general, if you were offering an opinion, and you could write either a very narrow, unanimous decision, or a more far-reaching decision while maintaining a majority of the court, which of those would you favor? I don't think it's necessarily which one I would favor, but in some, some cases, they call for a unanimous decision, which is very limited in scope, and in some cases, will call for a, a decision which there may be a, there's a split vote, and will call for a wide and far-reaching opinion. But I think generally I'm in, I'm in favor of um, unanimous decisions, which are which are which are fairly limited, because I think it's important, especially at the state Supreme Court level, in order to have consistent decisions on different areas of the law. And if you have a great number of wide-ranging opinions, um, where there's where there's a split and it's far-reaching, I think that can lead to in, inconsistent decisions, which will create a question of create questions in the lower courts, and especially in the court of appeals. I think that can be seen. Um, and then, but in North Carolina, in both the court of appeals and the Supreme Court, approximately 75 to 85 percent of deci decisions are unanimous. Um, however, when when there is a dissent called for or there is a split, I think those decisions on important societal issues should be far and wide ranging if if that is called for. Justice Jackson, Ms. Earls, do you agree with Mr. Engel on that? You have a different point of view. You know, I, I think that the court, one of the court's values is that we do value unanimous you know, opinions when we reach them. Um, our court over the past term that I've been there has been unanimous you know, between 75 and 85 percent of the time. And I think that's a good thing for the law in North Carolina. I think it's good for predictability and certainty for the legal community, for lawyers' clients, um, for the public. And I think, you know, we certainly all take our oaths very seriously. We uphold them. And when we disagree, when we need to disagree, we disagree. But if we can find a common result, we do that. Well, I would just point to my record again. Um, when I was on the Board of Elections, the State Board of Elections, at that time it was a five-member board. 
and we did value the collaborative decision-making process and most of our decisions were unanimous, particularly in some of the more high-profile cases that we considered. Ms. Reynolds, the next question goes to you first. Um, the retirement of U.S. Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy and the subsequent confirmation hearing for Brett Kavanaugh produced a discussion of, and some might even say the stipulation, that the nation's highest court needs to have a swing vote. What are your thoughts on this? And do you think the North Carolina Supreme Court needs a swing vote? Well, I think that we're in a different situation in our state courts because the um, it's really the voters who get to decide. Um, and so I sort of feel like it really doesn't matter what I think. Um, what matters is that the voters are informed of who's running and what, what they stand for and what their background and experience is, and then let the voters decide who they would like to see serving them. Either of the two of you want to share your view on the issue of the swing votes? Uh, you know, I think at the federal level, we have a president appointing and a Senate advising and consenting. And then again, uh, you know, I agree with Ms. We We stand for election. The voters have their right to choose whichever one of us they want to choose, but it's clearly the, the voters of the people. Mr. Anglin. Um, and I agree with both of them. I mean, I think um, in any decision which is being considered by the North Carolina Supreme Court, I think it's important for them to follow um, prior case law and also not let their any personal beliefs they may have influence their decision making. And I think traditionally, a lot of the like hot button topics um, have been reaching the Supreme Court. But I think potentially with the current makeup with uh, Kavanaugh getting appointed, I think a lot of those issues may fall to state Supreme Courts now. So I think there may be there may be issues coming before the state Supreme Court, which traditionally were the federal courts, which may be more divisive. Ms. Jackson, um, uh, kind of a dovetailing off of the point that Mr. Anglin just made, you know, if you listen, you watch, you read the news in North Carolina, you're going to be bombarded with all sorts of big stories, some of them making national news, creating lots of controversy or debate in our state. Some of those may at some point end up for the North Carolina Supreme Court. So how can the citizens of North Carolina be sure that you will stick with your judicial philosophy in cases where it can be kind of tough with um, intense public scrutiny? Well, I think for me, you know, you've got a 14-year record you can look at. Um, I've, again, as I said, I've authored around 700 cases, and I have sat on many, many more cases. And I think the important thing, too, to keep in mind is when I ran in 2004 for the Court of Appeals, the legislature was controlled by the Democratic Party. Um, in 2010, the legislature switched control to the Republican Party. But the constant throughout that 14-year period has been my judicial philosophy. And if it's not changed, um, you know, I have upheld decisions by the General Assembly when I was controlling Democrats. Uh, I've probably overturned some. I've upheld and overturned some. When I was controlled by Republicans, so I've been consistent, or at least done my best to be consistent throughout that 14 year period. What about intense scrutiny? You're sitting on the court, there's a lot of public pressure, stories being broadcast or printed every single day. How do you be informed and, and keep abreast of what's going on, but also separate yourself? Ms. Earls, Mr. Engel? I think um, one misconception that I think a lot of people have about it. And this is not attorney, but the general public has the Court of Appeals and Supreme Court, is that your decisions are made in the heat of the moment. You know, just when you're sitting there and the oral, oral, oral argument is made. But I think, of course, when you're in any, any appellate court and you have months and months to review the materials which have been submitted by the parties and, um, and review the relevant case, I think that that in part takes out the intense public scrutiny um, because and your what your whatever your personal beliefs might be on that scrutiny, and it allows you to to reach a more thoughtful decision. And if elected, I would interpret and not make the law. Ms. Earl, well, I think that ultimately it's a question of the integrity of the um, person who's sitting on the court. And my record, particularly in addition to. Being on the board of elections uh, for the past 18 years, I worked with nonprofit, nonpartisan organizations, and we uh, sought to vindicate the rights of anyone whose rights were violated. So, 
Um, for example, doing election protection work. If someone called us up, we didn't ask, are you a Democrat or Republican? We tried to find out what had happened, whether their rights had been violated, and whether there was a way that we could make sure that they had, that they were able to vote and that their vote counted. So I say that the, the voters have to evaluate based on our past record and our past experiences whether we'll have the integrity to apply the law fairly and equally to the cases that come before us. Mr. Anglet, how would you define your view on stare decisis? What rules would guide your decision on when to overrule an established precedent? Um, I'm a firm believer in stare decisis, and I think that's important as we, as I already referenced earlier, that there need, does need to be a consistent, consistency in the decisions, and, and especially the state Supreme Court where, the, where we have the fought, where it's the court of final resort unless there's some sort of um, U.S. constitutional issue. So I think that is very important because, as we previously mentioned, if there's not consistently consistency, it will be hard for the for attorneys and the public to interpret what the correct law is. But I think there are, there are times when prior precedent has to be overruled. But I think that's, but issues like that are few and far between when there needs to be a complete reversal of um, prior decisions. And you can see that in how those decisions are fairly rare. And a lot of times they're involved in some sort of important social issue. So I think um, when called for, there should be a reversal of the prior precedent. But for the, but for the most part, it's important to follow the prior case law. Agree? Disagree, Ms. Well, yes, I agree. Uh, stare decisis is a very important part of our judicial traditions, and in fact, it, in my view, it's part of the guarantee of equal justice. You, you can't treat everyone the same if you're changing the law in every case or, or changing law. But it's also important because um, businesses, individuals, um, everyone is making their decision about what they should do based on what they understand the law to be. And so if the law is ever changing, there's no certainty and it's just not good. Um, I, and I guess the other thing I would say about when do you decide that there does need to, that a prior decision was wrongly decided. Um, and there I think there's great comfort from the fact that there, are, there is, it is a seven-member court and no single justice gets to make that decision. Um, and so I think you, make that, you come to that conclusion um, in concert with your colleagues who um, have, have also come to that conclusion. Mr. Anglin mentioned um, that uh, few and far between, but perhaps on some social issues. So what about that? Is that how you see precedents uh, being over, overturned or overruled? What, what I'm trying to get is what type of issue? Is there a particular type of issue? He's identified social issues. Well, I guess that's where I want you to I'm sorry. No, that's fine. I was going to say, I think that's where I would depart. I think there could be any type of uh, area of law where there's a realization that the court previously got it wrong and needs to be changed. And, and I'm certainly here to start a decisive and precedent. I think precedent does provide predictability and certainty for lawyers and their clients and stability for the law. And I think that's just a hallmark of our legal traditions in this country. And you know, I'd be very reluctant to overturn precedent without very strong, um, compelling evidence that it should be overturned. Ms. Earls, do you believe it's appropriate to use legislative history or the purpose of a uh, statute in order to <coughs> interpret the statute as opposed to determining the meaning of a statute based on its words and phrases without regard to purpose? And if you believe that legislative purpose is a generally appropriate standard, does that give appellate judges room to lean on their policy preferences in interpreting a statute? So my view on this question is that, in fact, our, in our state uh, precedents, we're very clear about what the court should look to in interpreting statutes, and that you do start with the text, the actual words, what do they mean. Um, if there is ambiguity, then you look to the history, the um, intent of the framers of the law or the Constitution, and you look to the precedents interpreting it. But that's all set out in law. That's sort of not necessarily a matter of belief. It's what the what we have said, uh, what our precedents say is how we should interpret statutes or constitutions. 
be there. Do you would you like to come? We you know we do look at the plain words of the statute, and then um, occasionally we'll pull out legislative study commissions and other things to, to get history. But I, I don't. I really feel very strongly that it is not our job to substitute our policy preferences for those of the general assembly. We're just not the policy arm of state government. Okay. Um, I agree primarily with Ms. Earls. I think when possible you need to look to the plain language of the of the law and when necessary you should look at the legislative intent. Um, and but however I don't think that your that your personal political philosophy should have any influence on your movements. Okay, let's move to the next uh, portion of the forum in which we're going to have each of the candidates have an opportunity to ask one of their competitors <coughs> a question. And Justice Jackson, you will have the first question. Please let us know to whom you'd like to address it and what the question is. Um, I have a question for Mr. Anglin. You just commented about Justice Orr and admiring him and his opinions, even though he's a Republican. Could you explain that first? Well, if that if that is in fact what I said, that would be that's inconsistent with what the message I was trying to get. I mean, I think that um, Bob Orr, he was a Republican, and he had, and he didn't let his decisions, he didn't let his political affiliation influence his decisions on the court. And I'm trying to make the point that if elected, I would like to follow, I would like to follow in that same way. And I think um, it is, when you're asking questions like that that are so narrowly focused on a two-word phrase that we use, I mean, that's fair, but it's like, it's like deposition questions, where you point to, where you point to a specific page in line in the deposition, you're like, can you please clarify the statement and why you would say that? My, in response to the question of the type of judge I, what the type of judge I'd like to be, I was I've been very clear throughout this campaign that I would seek to be a justice like Bob Orr, and I reiterated that over and over again. All right, next question, Mr. Anglin, please let us know to whom you want to address your question and what the question is. And the question is directed towards Justice Jackson, and um, Justice Jackson, you've expressed over and over your experience and formed you're running a commercial about federal judges in sanctuary cities. Um, why are you implying to the voters that you have the authority to overrule a federal judge, and what relevance does that have in a state judicial election? I, I think you've missed the point of the commercial. The point of the commercial is that I'm a rule of law person. And unfortunately, with the funding that I had available to me to communicate my message, I had 15 second commercials available to me to communicate. And that, um, just doesn't allow for a sophisticated, complicated message. You have to draw the voters' attention. Um, it would be great if we could all sit down and have forums like this and have all the voters of North Carolina engaged in these forums and a long intellectual discussion about what we think and what we believe, but that opportunity just isn't available. So my point in the advertisement is just to communicate that I'm conservative in my judicial philosophy and that I adhere to the rule of law. All right, now to Ms. Earls. Um, please let us know to whom you'd like to address your question and what your question is, please. Well, I'll address my question to Justice Jackson, and I am a, a firm admirer of the notion of um, appreciative inquiry, and so I want to ask her to tell us who has endorsed her. Um, I've been endorsed by law enforcement, the Troopers Association, the Police Benevolent Association, the Fraternal Order of Police and the Troopers Police Association, um, which represent collectively thousands of law enforcement officials across the state of North Carolina. I have represent, uh, also been endorsed by the Republican Party, and I have been endorsed by the Defense Insurance Association. And to be honest, there's really one endorsement that I want, and that's the endorsement of the voters of North Carolina. During my three runs for office, I haven't had a lot of endorsements. And I didn't go out this year and seek a lot of personal endorsements. I haven't called up sheriffs and asked them to come out and let me put their names on my website. I haven't called up justices and asked them to let me put their names on my website other than Justice Burley Mitchell and then Sheree Barrett, Labor Commissioner, and Steve Troxar, Commissioner of Labor. 
I just don't know how valuable those endorsements are based on my own personal experience during the last two election campaigns. All right, thank you. Um, Justice Jackson, next question goes to you. Section 35 of the Declaration of Rights in the North Carolina Constitution reads, a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. What does that mean to you? You know, it means the Constitution is where we go. That is, that is the hallmark of what we do as judges. That is our, our, our vital keyword. And, um, you know, my colleague, Justice Newby, uh, always carries a constitution with him with that in mind. And, and, and I think, you know, I think one of the things too, I think, um, I think we sometimes forget that as citizens. I think that's one of the reasons our civics education has slipped and so many people, you know, even lawyers that I meet still don't know who our state Supreme Court justices are. Um, which is, I guess the positive about that is we're not out there being flashy and showing off. I guess the negative though is, is if lawyers don't know what are what are we missing in civics education? Mr. Earl, Mr. Anglin. Um, I'll go. I think to me, Section 35, it just reiterates the importance of the of both the state and federal constitutions, and specifically with reference to the separation of powers. Um, I think as any as you learn in any middle school or high school government class, you learn that the three branches of the government, the legislative judicial and executive branches are supposed to be separate and co-equal. I think that, to me, the Section 35 is just reiterating that. And I think it's important for the judicial system to, to make sure that they remain an independent and co-equal branch, especially from this current General Assembly, which has been attempting to make the judicial, the judiciary, an extension of itself. Ms. Earls? Well, now, I've said repeatedly, I think our state constitution is a rich source of protection of our individual rights, and that clearly part of the structure that the constitution sets up um, is our three co-equal branches of government that um, it sets up a system of, of checks and balances that is healthy for our democracy. I'd like to continue on the, the subject of the North Carolina Constitution. Um, some may think that it's a very dry document and, oh, why should, why should I read it? I'd like to um, hear from each of you. We'll start with Mr. Anglin, this to you. Uh, how do you describe the North Carolina Constitution when you talk to someone about it? Um, I would describe it as it's it's very similar to the U.S. Constitution, especially um, in Section One, where it sets out the rights that are given to North that are given to North Carolinians. And I would say it's important because it provides a manner in which the North Carolina government and its people can continue to function, and it creates a system where we're not. Um, it creates a system of government where. The general public does not have to be reliant on the on the feelings of people who are involved in politics, and it's supposed to and it's supposed to set out um, the framework within which our society operates. And I think it's also important that very similar to the U.S. Constitution, it gives you the framework, but it's very flexible to allow society to um, change over time and for it to continue to work. I mean, the, the, US, the, con the state constitution is, o is over 200 years old, and it continues to operate to this day, even though there, there have been all the changes um, in technology, society, et cetera. And I think that shows the framers genius of both the state and federal constitutions in the way that they set out, in the framework with which they set out in those documents. Justice Jackson, would you like to weigh in on that? Um, yeah. The, so the, the Declaration of Rights is what I talk about probably with the greatest frequency because I think it's so important that we adopted that in 1776. And some, some of the rights there derived from Magna Carta, um, the right to the jury trial, um, first and foremost probably the right to freedom of religion. And, you know, of course we didn't join the Union until they adopted the Bill of Rights, so we as a country adopted the Bill of Rights, and I think that's very telling that North Carolina felt so strongly that we put in place a Declaration of Rights right from the get-go. 
Ms. Hurts? Well, I do think that our state constitution is different from our federal constitution in important ways. And it deals with some matters in much greater detail that don't appear at all in the federal constitution. And I think that um, it has, uh, in part because it, it is more recent in the sense that it was most recently um, we adopted in 1971, it has, it's a little more recent than the, um, than the U.S. Constitution, and there are um, important ways that our Supreme Court has already said that the protections under our state constitution extend beyond those um, under the federal constitution. Next question, Ms. Earls, we'll begin with you on this one. The ballot contains the party affiliation for each of you, Justice Jackson and, and Mr. Anglin, who are listed as Republicans. Uh, Ms. Earls, you are listed as a Democrat. Is there such a thing as a Republican judge or a Democrat judge? And if there is, what's the difference? What does the party affiliation signal to a voter? So I certainly think that once um, someone is elected and they are sworn to uphold the, the Constitution and the laws of the state and the country, then no, there, there isn't a, such a thing as a public and a democratic judge. You are all there to do the same job, which is to serve all of the people of the state and, and put your best effort um, involved in applying the law equally to the facts and the cases that come before you. In terms of um, what information judges have, in order, or, sorry, voters have, in order to decide who they want to be a judge, um, you know, ju judges can't talk about policy outcomes we, because number one, we don't make policy, but number two, um, you know, we don't, we are very careful to not say how we might rule in any particular case. So voters really only have our record, and it, it, it appears, at least from recent voting behavior, that the voting, that the party label assists voters in deciding who they would like to vote for, and to that degree, I think that an informed public is, is a much better um, way to vote for judges. Either of the two of you like to weigh in? Yeah, I think, I, so I, I went to Duke in 2012 and got a master's in judicial studies, and one of the things that we looked at there a lot was the literature of the study of the judiciary, and there's a fascination with sort of tying political party as a proxy to um, judicial ideology. So, and I think sometimes that gets a little bit overblown. I, you know, I think it is some additional information for the voters. I do think that when you speak with judges, you know, what in the world is there that's partisan about awarding child custody and a termination of parental, you know, or, or dealing with a termination of parental rights hearing, um, criminal law, um, you know, whether a defendant is innocent or guilty, um, not guilty or guilty. There's just, we don't sit there and say, you know, to, to the attorneys that practice in front of us, are you a Republican or a Democrat? Um, it would never remotely cross any of our minds to do that. So I think that we take very seriously our oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the state, not inconsistent with the laws of the Constitution of the United States, and leave that behind when we join the bench. Mr. And um, as I mentioned, I'm against um, partisan judicial elections in North Carolina. It was the first state in you know, over 50 years to move from um, nonpartisan to partisan when this when the General Assembly made that change um, after the last state Supreme Court election. And I think whether, and I, and I don't I think having an R or D next to your name, it doesn't really convey that much information to voters. Because for, for better or worse, when voters go in, a lot of the times in judicial elections, it's the first time that they've ever, they've ever seen the name. And I think just because you have an R or D, it, it, it's not conveying inter information from them because the information that they're conveying is the person's beliefs on what a Republican judge is and what a Democratic judge is. So it's not it's not the positions or philosophies of the actual of the actual judge, but it's the person's interpretation of how a Republican or Democratic judge will act in rural cases. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, and it will lead to people making decisions generally just based, or a lot of the times, based on their party affiliation. And I think one, one positive thing um, that the that this state board election does is they send, out a, they send out a flyer with the information for each appellate judge to four and a half million households in the state of North Carolina. So that provides an opportunity for the voters to know, to, to get information about 
the judges and also their what their judicial philosophies will be. Um, okay. Uh, next question, we'll start with Justice Jackson. You know, in recent years, we've had quite a debate about the proper role of the judicial branch, and I think uh, several of you have, have uh, kind of woven that into some of your answers here. We do hear phrases like judicial activism, judicial restraint. So what do you make of the debate? Is it a serious debate that we should be having? And how does that uh, kind of mold into your view of the proper role of a judge? I, I do think it's a serious conversation to have. I, you know, I worry with with judicial activism versus judicial restraint. What you know, I worry about the perception of judiciary being um, whether we're politicized or not. And I, I've mentioned this in several forms that I've been at. There's an interesting book out called The Most Dangerous Branch. It was written by David Kaplan, who used to be a reporter for the Davis Association, with um, Newsweek, and it just kind of calls a pox on all our houses. Um, for judicial activism through the Supreme Court. It's kind of a, a thought-provoking read that I would certainly commend to your attention. Um, just going back, starting with, kind of starting with Marguerite versus Madison and um, Maryland, and the Bank of Maryland case, but also talk, touching on even Dred Scott in some of those cases as well. It's, it's really kind of interesting tracing through. But I think, you know, for my own part, I, I'm a firm believer in judicial restraint. Um, when we look at cases, we really just have a cold record on appeal in front of us, and we're not in the best position to make policy from that standpoint. That really is the, the province of the legislative branch, because we don't bring in any additional experts to testify in front of us. We can't convene a study commission or something like that to bring us additional information. So I think that I'm, I'm a firm believer in judicial restraint. I think that's the better course of action. Firm believer here. What about the other two? Um, I think. I guess my quick my definition of judicial activism would, would be when the judge lets their personal beliefs or any affiliation they might have make play a role in their decision making. Um, and I think that there should be adherence <coughs> to prior precedent. However, judicial activism is not a term I particularly care for because it seems like that term is is. It, it's used when there's an outcome that that you don't that the person that you don't like. So when when someone says, "Well, oh, those judicial, those like activist judges, they made this ruling," they're only saying that in the context of decisions that they disagree with. They're not saying it in the context of decisions that they do. They're not. They're never going to say it um, in reaction to decisions that they do agree with. Um, and I think it's um, and I think it's unfortunate the, that there has been the continued politicization of our um, of our both federal and state court systems. Um, and I think that especially the people that you saw it with Brett Kavanaugh hearings, I think um, like things like that, and then all the fighting about the appointment of judges, etc., at the federal level will lead to will lead to the general public um, losing faith in the justice system. And I'll notice it when I when I talk to people, even though the justice system is a separate co-equal branch from the executive and legislative, I think a lot of people no longer make that distinction. Like they'll lump they'll lump in the the police and the prosecutor in with in with the in with the judges. And I think that's unfortunate that people no longer make that um, Distinction. Have people lost faith in the judicial system? He just mentioned it. Ms. Earls, Justice Jackson? Yeah, I don't think so. And, and, and I think the very, very important thing, one thing that concerns me about this conversation is that our code of judicial conduct calls on us as judges to inspire public confidence in the judicial system. So I think if you're constantly tearing down the system, that's a problem within the code. Um, you know, I've made it a point of it from my perspective to do what I can to inspire confidence in the system. My concern is public perception of the courts. It is not what I see reflected in the courts. I see a, a fantastic judiciary in North Carolina of people who take their oath seriously, who uh, apply the law faithfully, interpret the law faithfully, and are fair and impartial. Um, and just as a clarification, I'd like to say I don't think that people have lost faith in the justice system, but I think that the increasing role of politics in it um, 
um, has the potential to er to erode people's confidence in it as a, as being fair and impartial. So I'm just highlighting that as a potential danger, especially what has happened in the last um, two years in this country. Ms. Earls? I'm not, sure, um, I'm not sure what your what the question is quite at this point, yeah. but I will say that. Um, I think that it is important. What what is important to me, what my commitment is, is to fair and impartial courts that provide equal justice under the law. Well, that's a perfect segue into uh, my next question, uh, and uh, we can start with Mr. Anglin on this. So more and more, society does seem to be focused on whether something is quote fair or just, not simply legal versus illegal or constitutional versus unconstitutional. So do you believe it's better for a judge to remain detached from perhaps the personal or more emotional impacts of a case, or to be compassionate and empathetic to the people who are affected? Is it appropriate for a judge, then, to try to right societal injustices? I think it's important for a, um, a judge to remain divorced from the outcome of the case, and, um, and that's what the role the judge is supposed to play, where their decisions are not ruled by um, emotion. Because, as mentioned previously, when there's precedent on that issue, that can, when there's, especially at the, the, especially at the appellate level, when there's decisions which are made on emotion, it can create law which is inconsistent with prior case law. So I think, I think it's important for judges to make their decisions fair and unbiased um, and leaving and trying to leave the emotion out of their decision. However, I do think there are, and this is a very limited number of issues, I do think there's some there are some social issues where it's appropriate for the court system to make rulings which um, might be at the forefront might be at the forefront and and they need to take into account. Um, this, the changes society has made um, before they do that rule. But I, that's only a highly limited number of cases. And I think generally that should be highly disfavored. Fair and just, illegal versus legal, constitutional versus unconstitutional. Anyone else want to weigh in? I, I mean, I think that they follow the rule of law. And sometimes that's very challenging because it can yield a harsh result. And that doesn't mean that we as human beings don't have empathy for the person for whom this harsh result is yielded. But we, you know, justice is blind. Whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you're the state, whether you're a private party, um, we have to issue fair and impartial justice. Um, a couple of times this evening, um, Mr. Anglin has mentioned the phrase social issues, so I'd like to talk about that in the legal context a little bit more. Do you believe that a judge sitting on the Supreme Court has an obligation to move society forward if culture or society is changing on a particular, uh, perhaps, controversial <coughs> issue? Uh, well, as I said before, I think that public policy is best left in the legislative branch and not in the judicial branch. And I think I think when the judicial branch looks at public policy, you know, our Chief Justice uh, established a commission on the administration of law and justice. And in that commission, we were able to bring in experts, we were able to bring in um, policymakers from across the state, um, judges, lawyers, non-lawyers, law school deans, law professors, and people from a wide variety of disciplines. And Although the judicial branch didn't have the ability to implement every recommendation that came out of the commission and had to part with the General Assembly on some of those commissions and some of that work is still ongoing, that to me seems to be the best way to do public policy in the judicial branch because we're not the public policy arm of the government. Ms. Earls, Mr. Anglin, the issue of social, social issues moving forward? Well, certainly it is not the role of the court to make public policy. It's the role of the court to interpret the law. Um, but I also agree that, um, it, that it is the role of judges to improve the administration of justice. So apart from um, how they're ruling in cases, uh, there are other professional activities that judges can engage in. 
And I would point to the Chief Justice's Equal Access to Justice Commission that I served on for nine years. That was an effort to make sure that um, everyone has, to the extent possible, to improve the opportunity of people of limited means who can't afford legal representation um, to have uh, access to legal advice or access to the courts when they need it most significantly. And there have been a number of changes that happened as a result of that commission operating. All of that happened um, through the professional activities of the judges, not through what they were ruling in the courts. Mr. And I think it's important for when a court is making any decision, it's important for them to stay within the role that's set out for them by the um, separation of powers clause in the North Carolina Constitution. And and also, it's as Mrs. As Mrs. had mentioned previously, it's not one person <coughs> decision is um, generally unanimous, but the more controversial issues, it's a majority. So it's not just the judge, it's not just one judge making the decision by himself. And I think and I think it is it is important for judges to play to play a role when they're not making decisions and trying to help um, ensure the administration of justice and to help make changes to the judicial system which could increase um, the availability and access of, of the general public, especially um, people who are, who are more limited means. And I think to me, justice, it, it means that you will have the same outcome regardless of what, you, of what that person's or business's resources are. And, as, and I think that's why it's so important to have consistent I mean, for a president to never remain consistent. So the outcome does not vary heavily from case to case. Ms. Earls, uh, next question will begin with you, please. We've talked a bit about philosophy. It's come out a bit in, in the answers that all three of you have given. But I'd like to go a little bit further. Who do you admire for putting your philosophy into practice? And uh, perhaps that's a current or former United States Supreme Court justice, perhaps <coughs> it's someone else in, in society and public life. Uh, but who do you identify with and uh, someone who best reflects your judicial philosophy? Well, I did mention earlier um, Chief Justice Frye, and uh, he is certainly an uh, inspiration to me. Um, similarly, Justice Patricia Thomas Goodson um, has, has uh, been a, a role model for me. And um, you know, they're just they're numerous, very fortunate that there are so many um, justices to emulate. And um, I, you know, I, I would be honored if the voters give me the opportunity to serve on the court. Justice Jackson? I had the privilege of clerking for Justice Burley Mitchell, as I mentioned. And what I really appreciated about Justice Mitchell was that he was, he's an extraordinarily intelligent person, but he's not uh, flashy with his intelligence. He's very practical and pragmatic and always had a common sense approach to the law, which I really appreciated as working for him. Very down-to-earth person, not at all pretentious, um, and, and really thought a lot of him as a person as well as a judge. Think a lot of him as a person as well as a judge. That's right. Um, I've mentioned it twice already. I would say Bob War. Um, he never let his political affiliations influence his decisions while he was a sitting judge. And also, I think since since he left the since he left the Supreme Court, he has um, he's, now that now that he's no longer a justice, he's taken up more of a political role. And I um, I'm appreciative of, of what he's doing currently because he um, is consistently standing up against the unconstitutional actions of the General Assembly when they've tried to make the judiciary an extension of themselves, and I think, and so much so that it actually led the, um, that it led Dallas Woodhouse, who was the executive director, director of the state GOP, to call him a revolt. And I think, um, and it's, and just his, his actions have shown that, that he will, while he's a Republican, He's not going to sit back and be silent as the General Assembly takes all these unconstitutional actions, especially with respect to the judiciary. 
Um, and I think with our, our last question here, I'd like to give you each an, another opportunity um, at what we did earlier, which is to ask another question of one of your competitors. So let's start with Justice Jackson. Uh, who would you like to address the question to, and what would that question be? Um, Ms. Earls, um, like you, I have spent some time doing advocacy work. I worked for the Advocacy Council for Persons with Disabilities Protection Advocacy Agency for North Carolina for four years, and I found that to be a very holistic activity. You weren't just representing a client, you were involved in a philosophy that you um, agreed with the entirety of what you're trying to do for someone. And what I've seen you speak about and write about with the website for the Southern Coalition for Social Justice, it seems like it was more than just simply serving as an attorney. So I'd like to understand how you can separate that very strong commitment to advocacy that seems to go above and beyond just serving as an attorney how do you separate that and transition to being a judge? Well, I, I think I take some issue with the premise of the question because I believe that it's every attorney's professional responsibility to do the absolute best they can for their clients. And that it certainly as a, litigation, as a litigator, the only difference between me and any other litigator who litigates in the state and federal courts in the state is who I've represented. Um, and so, I think that just as we believe that prosecutors can make good judges, and we believe that public defenders can make good judges, um, I believe that civil rights plaintiffs' attorneys can make good judges, and civil rights defendants' attorneys can make good judges. Um, and I think that I've demonstrated when I've had the opportunity in my career to take a step aside from the role of advocate and take on the role of either fact finder or reviewer, because the board elections both was the court of first resort when we, in some matters and we were reviewing decisions of local boards of elections in other matters and sometimes overturning the results of an election based on that, um, that, that in those roles I've demonstrated that I am fair and impartial and, and not any longer an advocate. So I think I have demonstrated I understand the difference between the two roles. And after 30 years of being a civil rights attorney, I'm now seeking the opportunity to serve as a justice on the Supreme Court, and I ask for your vote. Thank you. Mr. Anglin, uh, to whom do you wish to address your question, and what is your question? Uh, my question is for Justice Jackson, um, and my question is whether she is for or against um, partisan judicial elections, and whatever her answer is, what is the basis for that belief? You know, I, I don't have, well, I'm probably more inclined towards the nonpartisan elections. And from the standpoint that I, you know, I've run two nonpartisan elections, I'm in this partisan election, but I'll be candid, it's very hard to judge something objectively when you're in the midst of it. Um, my perspective is informed somewhat by the fact that it is easier as a judge, I think, to run in a nonpartisan election. I think it's, um, it's just a little bit, um, it, it seems a little bit more in sync with the role of being a judge. I certainly appreciate that voters get additional information when you have party identification on the ballot, and I think that there's value in that as well. But I think that um, I do have concerns about public perception of a politicization of the judiciary when we have uh, party identification on the ballot as well. So I don't think I have a 100% a answer on that at this point in time. I may have a better answer after this is over with the time to reflect on it because it really is just hard to judge something when you're in the midst of it. Um, but it does seem to be a little bit more challenging. And as a, a corollary to that, um, you know, the first two elections that I ran when we had public financing available as well, and it's very different when you are in the midst of the election where you're soliciting funds um, to, to run your campaign as well as being in a partisan race. So there were two very different experiences in this campaign versus the first two times that I ran. And Ms. Earls, uh, to whom would you like to address your question, and what is your question? Well, I'll address my question to Mr. Anglin, and I will continue with my practice of appreciative inquiry and ask you um, to tell us what made you decide to become a lawyer. Um, I decided to become, a lawyer, to become a lawyer because I think I wanted to be one from a young age. My mom recently provided me with a project that I did in either fourth or fifth grade where I said in the, in the project that I wanted to be a lawyer. So I think I knew um, at a young age that I wanted to become an attorney. 
And at that age, I thought it, I wanted to become a lawyer because I thought it would be an important job where you can, where you'd be able to help people out, and you'd be able to basically, you'd be able to stand up for justice. And I wanted, I always wanted, I was a major, being a law and order fan, especially in the long high school, and I always wanted to be a prosecutor. That was my goal after graduating from law school, was to, to work at a prosecutor and, um, and help out people who were victims of crime. And it, and it ultimately didn't work out like that, but I think I've been able to continue to help people and to make a positive difference in their life. And then another thing, that why I wanted, and another reason I wanted to become a lawyer is because it allows for a 200, at least in state court, for state superior court, it, it allows for a $200 filing fee, it allows any person or business to um, bring a lawsuit against any, against any other person or business, no matter how big or small they are, or how much money they, they have or don't have. And I think that's important because the, um, the judicial system, that's the ultimate leveling of the playing field. Um, and you can see that in, and you can see that in decisions which go against which go in favor of those who the needs. I think um, that's also one of the reasons I want to become aware. And that concludes our questions this evening. Please join me in thanking the candidates for this morning.